H-U-P-L. All right, uh, let me make sure I do backup recording. Um, all right, so uh, some quick things, administrative things from, from last class. Uh, it's only been one day. We already got emails. Um, so uh, the first thing is that I made a mistake last class. I said Ted Codd got his PhD at Penn. He got his PhD at Michigan, where all the great data people got their PhDs. Uh, so uh, Mike Stonebreaker got his PhD there. Ted Codd got his PhD there. David DeWitt, another famous Davis guy. So it was not Penn. It was, uh, it was Michigan. All right, the other thing is people complain that, uh, about the audio. Dear Andy, the audio of your class sucks. Why can't see me afford a sound engineer? Do it right. Andy, I love the course, but I can't listen to it because the audio is messed up. What happened? Why are you doing this? I lost the will to live. Um, so that, that was my fault last time. So we're double recording. So hopefully we won't have any uh, issues uh, with posting it this time. And then we actually got emails about you, uh, which is surprising, right? Uh, I saw DJ2PL last month performing la uh, at the Bridge uh, 21 and Over show in Pittsburgh. Is that true? Yeah. All yeah, yeah. right. Okay. Uh, you're very lucky to get a DJ like that. He is expensive. Uh, Simu's have a lot of money. Simu does not have a lot of money. Okay. Yo, TJ, okay. DJ2PL is ridiculous. Is he single? I'm asking for my friend. Um, <laughs> and then they wrote, she's like Taylor Swift but without any thumbs. I don't know what that means. Uh, so, are, are you single? I'm not, unfortunately. Okay. So, um, <laughs> all right, so... All right, anyway, that's their problem. Uh, all right, cool. Uh, so today's class, we're going to talk about SQL. Um, the last class, we spent time talking about the relational model. We talked about how, in my opinion, that it's superior data model for every possible database you can sort of think of. The, data the relational data model can be uh, used to represent pretty much all the different schemes that, that are out there. Um, and then we showed how relational algebra was the building block for how we would execute queries or, or define queries to operate over uh, on, on a relational database. So today's class is really now to talk about SQL, which is a, again, a declarative or non-procedural language for interacting with a, a database system. And what we'll see over time is that SQL has evolved where in the beginning, in the 1970s, when it was first defined, it was very strict about what, what a relational database should look like. But uh, in the last 40 years, it's expanded to support things that don't look relational, like JSON, for example. Um, so let's, let's start at the beginning, talk about how SQL got started, and then we'll talk about uh, the, the sort of more interesting, interesting things you can do in modern versions of it. So the, the SQL goes back to the 1970s. Um, and again, for Ted Cobb, when he wrote that first paper, he didn't define a programming language for operating relational databases. It was all mathematical. People said, like, oh, the, 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 you know, the, the paper was so inscrutable, nobody could understand it. Uh, if you actually read it, it's actually pretty easily understandable. It's just people didn't like math back in the day, I guess. Um, so then he, so some people at IBM saw his paper and tried to start building, you know, experimental relational databases to see whether they can actually take his mathematical ideas and put it out, put it into practice. And so the very first relational database language, as far as I, I know, um, was this thing called Square that IBM invented in 1971. Um, and this was for an earlier project that IBM was developing for a, one of the first relational database systems, probably the first one, um, which sounds, it sounds like a weird experimental rock band. Right? It's called the Peter Lee Relational Test Vehicle. Right? But that was the first thing they built as an as a early prototype to show that you could take Ted Codd's ideas and actually put it into a real system. The problem with Square, though, is that you could never actually reuse it because you had to write in weird notation and vertically. Uh, which is not you can which you can't really do right so this is uh this is from the, the original one of the original papers right so you would write right this is how to do a you know a scan on the, on the sales table by department like you would write in this weird vertical way with characters that you wouldn't have on a keyboard even today right so no one actually ever did this so then uh ibm threw that away and they started building a new query language called sql spelled s-e-q-e-l um, for the System R project, which is a, is a system we'll talk about throughout the semester. But this was the, the second relational database system that IBM started building to try to show that Ted Codd's uh, work could actually be done. The, the Peter Lee one, that was in the UK. That was a small team. The System R project was in San Jose um, at IBM Research, and that was, that was a major, major undertaking. Um, so they defined SQL back in 1972. This was uh, uh, Don Chamberlain and Boyce. They work in this query language. Um, 
And the idea was, it was supposed to be the structured English query language. But in the 1980s, when, when IBM put out a, a commercial relational database system, they got sued for the term SQL, like uh, the name SQL, because there was some other system or some, some other piece of software that was using it. So then they just re reverted it back to, uh, to, to SQL, which is the letters, right? the structured query language. Um, there was another pro uh, very famous project at the same time out of Berkeley in the 1970s when System R was getting started uh, called Ingress. Who here has heard of Ingress? Nobody. Who here has heard of Postgres? You ever wonder why Postgres is called Postgres? Because it's post Ingress. The guy that built Stonebrick, when he built Ingress, uh, he commercialized it in the, the late 1970s and then went back to Berkeley in the 1980s and built a new system that was supposed to be post Ingress. That's why it's called Postgres. Um, so they, Postgres, or sorry, Ingress had this other query language called Quell. And so SQL, the play in the words is that it's supposed to be the SQL to Quell. Because the IBM guys knew what, what the Berkeley people were doing, and they would try to build a, a better query language. Stonebreak would argue that Quell is better, uh, but of course, no one uses that today. IBM released a, a couple of uh, relational, so, uh, in the 1970s, IBM was making a lot of money off of IMS, which is a not, a, not a relational system, not, didn't support SQL. And then they realized that SQL was going to go somewhere, relational data were going to go somewhere. So they released a bunch of early prototypes like System 38, SQL DS. Uh, but the big one that, that really took off was DB2, which is still around today. Um, again, IBM was the, was the big juggernaut in the computing world. So whatever IBM said they, they were going to do, that sort of became the de facto standard. So when IBM came out with a relational database that supported SQL, even though there were competing languages like Quell, everyone uh, coalesced around uh, Around, around SQL. So SQL became a standard in an ANSI standard, which was an American standards body in 1986, and then it became an international standard in 1987. Um, and so even though it's a you know, 50, 60 year old language now, uh, it has evolved and expanded over time. So the, the latest version of the SQL standard actually came out in March this year, in 2023. Um, and you can see sort of list here the history of all the updates, the various features they've added over time. And the main takeaway from this, from this listing here is that as, as programs evolve, as applications evolve, or the trends in, in development, software development has evolved, SQL has, 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 has moved along with it and adopted the ideas and adopted new, new capabilities. So in, in 2023, the big two features that have come out is now you can do property graph queries directly in SQL. So somebody brought up Neo4j last class, right? That's a, that's a, a special purpose graph data model database system. But now you don't need that anymore because now you can run graph queries directly in SQL because the SQL standard supports it. They also add support for multidimensional arrays. Right? So I said before that a lot of machine learning stuff is, is based on arrays or matrices. Now you can operate dire directly on SQL, these things. Now just, just because the standard has defines it doesn't mean every system is going to support it, right? Uh, I, I don't think any system really supports the the multi-dimensional array stuff. Like Oracle supports the property graph stuff. Postgres will eventually get there. DuckDB will eventually, DuckDB has a prototype for it. But just because it's in the standard, not everyone's gonna actually be able to support it. So I would say, in my opinion, the, the minimum support you need for SQL to say that your database supports SQL is defined in the SQL 92 standard, right? That's like select, insert, update, delete, create tables. Like that's, that's the basic functionality. So again, even though SQL is over 50 years old, it's not a dead language and there's updates all the time. And of course, every 10 years, or every five years, some new technology comes out and people say that SQL's dead uh, and it's about to be replaced. Um, 10 years ago, it was no SQL. And the hot thing now is ChatGPT or vector databases. So you see a lot of these kind of things on, on Twitter or uh, on social media where they claim SQL's gonna die because ChatGPT is gonna replace it or natural language is gonna replace it, right? This is all a, this is all a bunch of hype. Um, it's interesting, but it's not gonna replace SQL. Like SQL was here before you were born, and SQL will be here when you die, OK? <laughs> and I, I've made public statements to, basically about this. So there's an article uh, they quoted me in uh, last year in some, some magazine or something. I basically said, you need to know SQL if you want to do anything in, in, in computer science. All right. So the, in a relational language like SQL, it's going to have sort of three parts. There's going to be the DML, the data manipulation language. That's how we're going to, uh, that's our select, insert, update, delete queries that interact with in our, in our database. 
but be the DDL, the data definition language. That's the create table statements, the create views, right? To create the entities, the objects uh, in our database. And then there'll be, we're not really going to cover this, but there'll be the DCL, the data control language. That's for like security and access control. Right? Some systems allow you to have like, you know, you can specify what users are allowed to see what rows or what columns or what tables and so forth. Right? So the SQL standard specifies for, the, for these things. Another big thing we'll see later in the semester is definition of transactions. Right? How, do you, how do you define a bunch of SQL statements that you, you want to happen atomically um, in an isolated way? And again, the, the SQL standard supports this. So again, we'll see bits and pieces of this as we go throughout the semester. But for today's lecture, we're really going to focus on the first one, the, the DML. And a reminder from, from, from picking up where we, went, where we were all left, we talked about last class, uh, SQL is going to be based on bags, meaning there, there, there could be duplicates, um, whereas relational algebra was based on sets. And we see some cases where we'll, we'll have to add extra stuff in our SQL statements to, um, to, to, to deal with that. So today, again, is supposed to be a crash course on modern SQL. I'm assuming everyone, whether or not you know it or not, you, you know enough from the SQL 92 standard, right? Select, insert, update, deletes. And I want to talk about the, I want to talk about the sort of more, more sophisticated things you can do with them. But, but the overarching theme also will be is that we will open up the terminal, we'll try a bunch of these queries in different database systems, and we will see that even though there is a SQL standard, there is a you know, internationally recognized document that says, here's what SQL should look like, nobody implements it exactly that way. Right? Everyone's going to have these weird nuances and quirks where they have different features or different uh, nomenclature or syntax to do certain things, uh, and in some cases, different semantics of, of different operations, where even though there's a SQL standard, it's going to be different from one system to the next. Who do you think, I'm going to take a guess, who do, you think, who, who do I think is the biggest offender for the worst SQL implementation? Worst is not the right word, but like the one that deviates from the standard the most. I'm going to take a guess. All right, the top four out of the, yes, in the back, yes. MySQL, My he got it right, yes. MySQL is going to be the, the out of all of these where they're going to do all sorts of weird uh, More recently, they, they now have a flag where you can make it be more strict and, and try to be more closer to this, the SQL standard. But for the longest time, they do a bunch of weird things. And my problem is that I first started using databases, relation databases, in like when I was in high school in the 90s, and we were using MySQL 3. So I have all these bad habits that like I picked up from MySQL, and I'm like, oh yeah, this is what SQL is. Then you realize when you start playing other systems, like this is crazy. They're doing some weird stuff. Um, but it's gotten better. And MySQL 8 has has certainly improved a lot. All right, so we'll go through through all of these aggregations, group buys. The string date and time operations, that's going to be the, the one where we see all the problems. And then a bunch of other different ways to, to, to interact with SQL queries. And then another theme about what we'll talk about is the goal of writing SQL statement of, oftentimes is to try to do all the computation on the, the database server itself within one sort of one overarching SQL query. Meaning we don't want to have to do a select, get some data back into a Python program or something, then, then, then operate on it and then push it back and do more queries. We want to try to do everything we can on the, on, on the server side inside the database system. Because we want to be able to push the query to the data, not pull the, the, the data to the query. Again, this makes this make more sense as we go along. All right, so for today, we're going to use a, a simple uh, example database like this. Um, it has three tables, student, enrolled, and course. Right? It's, it's, it's basically trying to mimic a university. They're students, they take classes, uh, and they're enrolled, and they get grades in the various courses that, that are there. Okay, so we'll use this as, as, the, as the sample database as we go along. All right, first thing is aggregations. So aggregate, aggregate functions are a, a, a way to compute some uh, mathematical computation on, a, on a, a, a sequence of data or a bag of tuples, and you're basically going to coalesce it down into a single value. So the classic things would be average, min, mount, uh, average, min max, sum, and count. Right? You're trying to compute, like, the, the min value of, of a column across all tuples within, within a relation. So a simple example like this, so say we want to get off for the students, we want to count the, uh, the number of students so have a login where the, the, the login uh, ends with at CS, like you have an at CS uh, email address. And so we just put the count function here, um, and then the inside of it actually doesn't matter for a count, but we're just saying we're going to count the, the logins. And then we have our where clause specifying when uh, or what tuple should qualify. So again, in my example here, I'm putting login. You don't actually have to do that. You could put a star. That's equivalent. 
right? Because again, it's just counting the number of, of entries. You can actually put one, again, also equivalent. It doesn't matter. Inside, you can really put anything. Right? You can put one plus one plus one. Right? And the database system should be smart enough to realize, that, okay, in this exa last example here, I don't care what's, what the expression is inside of the count, and I won't actually do that math because I just care about what, what's, the, what's the count of tuples that I have. You can have multiple aggregates in a single select output. So here now we're going to compute the average GPA and the, the counting the number of students, again, with have, that have the at CS uh, login. And you get this, you know, you get back a single entry or single record in the output uh, result for, for the two computations. Important thing to understand, though, if you, with aggregation, since you're trying to coalesce down a, you know, multiple tuples within, you know, to a, to a single scalar value, you can't reference anything in the in the select output that isn't that, that isn't part of the aggregate. So I can't do something like this. I can't go select the average GPA uh, after you join the student table, the enrolled table, and then also spit out the the course ID of the enrolled enrolled table, right? Because this is not defined, right? This doesn't make make any sense, right? There, there isn't. Again, you're you're taking multiple rows, you're you're condensing it down, closing it down, collapsing it down for the compute the average. What is the course ID in this context, right? It's nothing. So if you in, in this case here, what you what, if you sort of look at this, what you're really trying to do is you're trying to get for each course ID get the average GPA. So what you need to do it uses what are called a group by clause where you're going to project tuples into to buckets based on whatever the, 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 the parameters are in the group by clause, and then compute the aggregate on each individual bucket. So you sort of think of it like this. If I first do the, the join between the enrolled table and the student table, I have, all the, you know, I have all possible combinations based on the join, and then now I'm going to split them up based on the, the course ID, because that's what I have in my, in my group by clause. And then now I compute the average on, on for the GPA for each for each of those buckets. Make sense? All right, and just matches up like this. So again, the, the main takeaway of this again, you have to have anything that's in a uh, anything that's not part of an aggregation has to appear in the group by clause. So again, in this case here, I don't have the student name. I, I can't I can't put that there. I'd have to put it in, in the group by clause. Uh, we can open the terminal if you want. MySQL used to let you do, do this in some cases. Um, but we can actually, let's, let's try it and see what happens. And I hate typing on my, uh, my surface. So I'm going to use this, this laptop here. I'll log into it. All right, so we want to do this. All right, so I have Postgres. I have a bunch of database systems running. So the query we were trying to do was uh, essentially this, right? Select average GPA, course ID from enrolled, joining enrolled table and student table, right? So Postgres doesn't let you do this because it says the, the course ID has to appear in the group by clause. That's good. That, that's what we expect. Let's go over to MySQL. MySQL doesn't let you do it. Um, but let me see if I put it in the right mode. By default, All right? It doesn't let you do it, but there's a way to. It's, it's enforcing. Um, it's enforcing the what, what what mode it's in. So if I go to traditional, then now run the same query, it lets me do it, and it spits out course ID fifteen four forty five. Is that correct? No, right? Because what does that mean? I mean? It's the average GPA for all courses, but now it's spitting out one of them. So that's that's bad. So let's go now, take the same query, and we'll go over to, uh, to SQLite. All right, who thinks it's going to work? Raise your hand if you say yes. And when I work, meaning like it'll actually run the query. I'm not saying the result's correct. Who thinks it'll, we have one yes, two yeses. Who says no? Most people say no. It did it. All right? And it also spit out 15,445. Is that the same value as MySQL? Yeah, GPA looks, oops, sorry. GPA looks the same. Um, all right, let's go to Oracle. Oracle doesn't like it. Let's go to DuckDB. 
Duck to B didn't like it. So my sequel, you can do it if, if you if you make it be more like my sequel five and seven instead of eight, but sequel light will do it. So again, like the this is the first example we'll see it many times that like sequel says standard says one thing, but P, the different systems are doing different things. All right, next thing you can do is have a, you can have a having clause. Like say if you want to start filtering on on these aggregation ag the aggregate columns you're generating, uh, you can add a having clause to specify whether what how many what tuple should match after you complete the aggregation, right? So say I want to get only show me show me only the students that have an average GPA uh, that's greater than three point nine. So in this case here, I'm computing the aggregation, right? Select average GPA as uh, as a GPA, and I'm trying to reference it here inside of my where clause, right? I can't do that because at this point, when the system is actually calculating the query, it's computing the aggregation as it goes along. It can't doesn't know what the final result is, right? So the easy fix for this is to have a having clause, which is basically telling the system, okay, perform what our aggregation is, pr produce the output that's defined in the select statement, and then apply this additional filter uh, for having. This is actually not correct either, in some cases. This, I don't think the SQL standard lets you do this either, right? Because even though I have an alias up here for average GPA, the, the, the data system can say, I, I don't know what this is. My SQL lets you do it. Uh, Postgres does not. So instead, you have to basically write the, 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 the aggregation clause again. And again, the database system should be smart enough to recognize that this average from the GPA is the same as that average GPA up there, and therefore compute the, the same computation don't perform, perform, perform the same computation twice. Right, so essentially just doing this. Again, compute the aggregation, and then do the additional filtering to throw out things you don't. Make sense? All right. Strings and timestamps are, are, are dates of when things get, get, really, uh, get really weird. Not weird, but like really inconsistent. So for string, func string operations, or sorry, string data types, the... SQL standard specifies that the, the case of the strings within the values, because I don't mean the strings in the select statements, I mean like the actual data you're storing, that they should be case sensitive, and that you, you, when you want to have in your SQL statement constant strings, you want to use single quotes. Postgres, SQL Server, and Oracle follow the standard. My SQL is, by default, case insensitive. Um, and then they, both SQLite and, and my SQL support both single and, and double parenthesis or double quotation marks to represent constants and strings. So let's see what MySQL does and see how weird this is. So let's go back here. Um, right, so, um, so you can represent a, a constant like this. Right, so you can have a select statement without a, without a from clause in MySQL, right, and I can represent it basically takes whatever the input is, and I can it'll spit it out. So I put a comma, like I can get like I can do like one, two, three, like that. It'll make columns for all the, the, the things in the output. So for strings, I can have it as double quotes uh, and single quotes, right? In the case of Postgres, it won't let me do double quotes, right? Can't do that because it's trying to look for a column name Tupac. That's the way you sort of escape column names. But it'll, it'll support uh, uh, single quotes. So in SQLite, they support both. So I can go Tupac like this. And I can go with single quotes like that. In Oracle, it's single quotes. But it doesn't like queries without, without a from clause. So in Oracle, they have this weird thing called the dual, the dual table. And this is a fake table that comes with Oracle to allow you to write these kind of queries that against tables that don't actually exist. Right? So then I, I can get that. If you try to do like select star from, from dual, right, you just get like an X. I think the newer version, they got rid of the dual. You don't need it anymore. This is, this is Oracle tw I think 21, so it's, it's a rather newer version. Right, um, so like you can't do you can't do this, but like in Postgres or any any other data system, you can treat the, you can treat SQL as like a calculator. You just, you can just put whatever you want in a clause like that, right? 
So, all right, let's go back to my SQL and let's look at some st string functions. So, I can call now. I can do like select star from student where name equals Tupac with you know weird casing, and then it, it matched on the string Tupac, right? Because internally my SQL is treating the var chart as as case insensitive. So if you want to now, uh, if you want to have it treat it like a you know a, 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 like any other database system where it actually is actually looking at the case as a true var char, you can add this binary flag in front of the or a keyword in front, front of the, the column name, and that'll treat it as like a binary uh, string, like any, any other system. In this case here, now it doesn't match, but now I, it, should, it tells me I have a warning. So now I gotta go now call show warnings. And this is, again, this is MySQL specific. So now they tell me that the, the binary expression is deprecated and be removed, and they tell me at least how to write it correctly. So now I, I, I have to cast the, the name as, as a binary, and then I can call it. Right, so if I change the casing again, then I get Tupac. So this burns a lot of people because end up, you end up like thinking, oh, I'm, if, if you don't know that your varchar is case insensitive, you could store things multiple times and uh, you know, thinking that it's going to be different because the case is different, but then MySQL says they're, they're the same. Again, this is only MySQL. I don't know any other database system that actually does this. So that, that's a weird one. Yes? Uh, the question is, why is the name capitalized? Yeah. Yeah. So, so if, I, if I want to insert like a Tupac with you capitalized, that, uh, would, would that override it, or what's So, so the question is, uh, I'm telling you. So there, there's the data is being stored with the case sensitivity. The comparison operator, when it actually executes the where clause, is ignoring case. Okay. Right. So it's not calling whatever string compare that you'd have in libc. Uh, it's calling either their own version of it or the, the case insensitive version of it. Because that was some decision that somebody made in the 1990s that has carried over today. Yes? Why did they make the decision? Why did they make the decision? Yeah. Uh, ask me that question at the very end, if you get through all the bull****. Okay. I, again, it's, it's probably because somebody just did it the one way, you know, they decided how to do it, right? Or... My SQL, the guy was actually in many cases trying to follow what Oracle did in some cases, but Oracle doesn't do this. I, I have no idea, right? We can email the guy. Uh, he's still alive. Um. <laughs> so yeah, I mean, there's a lot of times where people just did stuff because like one person did it without like thinking through the, the implications of it. Um, or they're trying to copy some other system where they liked out some other you know, particular feature or functionality, right? Any other questions? Uh, we'll see many examples where, like, why would ever, anyone ever do this? You know, do it this way. Um, all right. So I think I showed a query like this before. Just make sure you see it. So there's this like uh, like operation in in SQL, and you use this for sort of really primitive string matching or pattern matching. So you would use a you call a like, and then you would say um, you would have a, a, a percent sign to represent a wild card. So instead of, if you're coming from, from like the Unix world, star or regular expression usually means uh, match anything or dot. In SQL, it's the, it's the percent sign, and that'll match <laughs> any substring, uh, including empty strings. But if you just want to match one character, you would use the, the underscore. And there is support for regular expressions. I forget whether that, 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 that is in the SQL standard, but everyone does it slightly different. Um, but you can write more complex uh, string matching, um, string matching patterns. There's a bunch of string functions that also come in the SQL standard to do things you would expect. Like if you're familiar with Python, there's like all the Python functions, um, uppercase, lowercase, substrings, replacing strings, right? All that, all that's in the SQL standard. And for the most part, these are going to be pretty consistent across the, uh, the, the various systems. Where things go wrong is what we think would be the most simple operation, concatenating two strings. That's where everyone likes to do something slightly different. So the SQL standard says the double, uh, the double bar is the way you can catch strings. Um, in, in SQL Server, they support, the, they use the plus sign. Um, and then in MySQL, they don't have, at least under the, the default mode, they don't have the double bar. They don't support the plus sign. 
you have to use the concat function. Right? And we can see that real quickly. So going back to my SQL. So I want to do something like this, right? I get another warning. I show warnings. And it tells me it doesn't like my syntax, right? Um, oh, maybe was, that, was the that was the first warning. Sorry. Boom. I got two warnings. It says the, the double bar is a synonym for the or, and therefore it's going to be deprecated. Um, and they didn't like the way I uh, was sending along at the, the at sign in CS. So if we now try to call, we change the SQL mode in my SQL to follow the, 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 the SQL standard. Now I can, I can get the, the concatenation that I want. Um, right? So again, it's concatenation, I think it would be super, super, it would be, everyone should do the same thing. But again, it's some, in case of my SQL, it's some le legacy thing from the 90s that they're, they're, they're trying to slowly undo. All right. Date and time is, is probably the, the, the worst one. So the SQL standard defines a bunch of ways to define uh, date types, time types, also time, times with timestamps, um, different calendar types, Julian calendar, Gregorian calendar. But how, again, how the, the syntax is going to vary is, is going to be pretty annoying. So I want to give it now a demo where try to do what would seem like a simple, simple calculation, a simple computation. We just want to count the number of days since from today to the beginning of the year. It's like 230 something, 240 something, right? Just the number, the total number of calendar days. So we're going to do this first in Postgres, and then we'll do this in, uh, in, in MySQL, and do this in, in SQL Server. So the first thing we need to do is figure out how to get the current date, right? The current, current time, right? Well, there's in, in Postgres, there's a function called now. And that'll give you, uh, you know, th th you'll get back a timestamp with the current date. In, uh, in, in MySQL, you can do the same thing. In SQLite, they don't have a now function. In DuckDB, DuckDB is going to follow pretty much Postgres for, for a lot of things because it's based, they use the same, uh, the same uh, SQL grammar. So they have a now function. And we'll go to Oracle. Oracle does not have a now function. All right, so there's another way you can get the, the timestamp. So in the SQL standard, there's something called uh, a function called current timestamp. Right? Except it's not a function, it's a keyword. And then in MySQL, they have the function, they have the keyword. In SQLite, they don't have the function, they have the keyword. And an Oracle doesn't gives us a weird error about that one. We'll come back to that in a second. And they, they don't have the keyword. So they have the function, but we're getting this other weird error. Date, time, interval, precision, out of range. OK, so what's that? Uh, so now we got to go back and maybe, oh, because right, it's, it's, it's Oracle. It doesn't like having a select clause without a from, a select statement without a from clause. So let's add our fake table, dual. <laughs> Right? Then we get it. Right? <laughs> but it's the keyword and not the timestamp. Right? All right, so now we, all right, so at least now we can get the, the, the current timestamp the current, of the current day. Um, and so what we can do is now there's a, we can start casting strings or varchars into date types. And then there's this extract function in the SQL standard that allows us to extract some part of, of that date or timestamp. So this is saying extract the day from, and then today's date as a string casted into a, uh, into a date type, all right? And again, there's syntactic sugar for all these different systems that, that are like non-standard. So in Postgres, if I try to just give the string, it's going to throw an error because it says it can't, I need to operate, the extract function needs to operate on the date, but you're giving me a varchar. But I can add these, the two colons at the end and then put date at the end, and then that's going to cast it to a, uh, to a date type. Oh, can you see that or no? Sorry. Yeah. Uh, shoot, sorry. Let me do this. Yeah. Wait, oh, my, I, I know it's wrong. Sorry. Let's try it again. All right, so here. 
I can give it a string and then I put colon colon date and that converts it to a date. But that's only in, uh, in Postgres. I can't do this in, in any other system except for DuckDB because they, they follow the same standard. Right? So if I go to my SQL, try to do the same thing. Doesn't like that. Go to SQLite. Doesn't like that. Go to DuckDB. Or, or Oracle's not going to like that from dual. Doesn't know what a date is. Um, and this DuckDB should do it. Right? Because, again, DuckDB follows the same grammar. OK. So we can use the extract function to maybe extract what the, the, the current date is or try to figure out what, how many days since, since from now until the beginning of the year. So let's start with Postgres. So it turns out it's pretty simple um, with Postgres. So we can just cast the string uh, of today's current date to, uh, to, a, to a date type uh, and then subtract it from the string of the current um, of the, of, sorry, of, of the beginning of the year. And we could use the, if you wanted to, we could go back here and use current timestamp, or use, maybe use the now function. And this should work, right? So that gets today, so cast it as a date, subtracting the, or taking the today's date and subtracting it by the beginning of the year. And we get two, 241, which I assume is correct. Um, so let's try the same thing now in, uh, in my SQL. So again, we'll, since they don't have the now function, we'll do it for casting. All right, so now we get a weird number. We get 729. What's that? Uh, and surprisingly, actually, somebody on YouTube, in a comment of all places, told me what it was. It's the, and this is weird. So the first number is the, today's current month subtracted by January. So 8 minus 1 is 7. Then it's, uh, today's what, the 30th? So then it's the today's day subtracted by January 1st. So that's 29. So you get 729, right? So that's wrong. We can't do that. Uh, so what we can do instead is we can, we can, uh, oh, sorry. We can get the, too many windows, sorry. All right, there we go. All right, sorry. So what, what we're doing here now is we're getting the, the Unix, we're getting the date of today and beginning of the year, converting it to a Unix timestamp. All right, Unix timestamp is the, it's the number of seconds since the Unix epoch, so like, like January 1st, 1970. Um, so we're converting it now to the number of seconds from today uh, since 1970. And then we subtract that from the number of seconds since, since January 1st. And we divide that by 60 seconds times 60 minutes times 20, 24 hours. Um, and we get 241. So I, this, this, this is my original idea. Um, and then it turns out there's a date diff function in, <laughs> in my SQL that you can do this. But Postgres doesn't, ha doesn't have it. DuckDB doesn't have it. Let's see if Oracle has it. I'm dual. <laughs> All right, they, they don't have it. All right. All right, so that's a, MySQL, that's a MySQL thing. All right, so now let's try in SQLite. So SQLite doesn't have date diff. Uh, we can't do that, that subtraction that we did in Postgres. The, the best solution I could come up with is the convert the timestamp for today, beginning of year, to the Julian calendar, which is the number of days since Julian Caesar's birthday in whatever BC. Uh, you laugh, but a lot of the banks ran off that in the in the up until the 80s, right? Um, and then you get 241. But of course, we're getting it as a, as, a, as a floating point number, so we can cast it as an integer, and then we get 241, right? I, I'm not, I, I forget how to do this in Oracle. We're not, I'm not going to do it in Oracle. Um, but, I, but the main point, again, it like, seems like it'd be a simple thing, but all these timestamp stuff is, is, is woefully different. All right, any questions about this so far? Yes. yes. Why would you want a lower function? Um, uh, good question. Um, I mean, you might need it for like data cleaning. Uh, you might want it for, yeah, it's a good question. I mean, it's in the standard, right? 
it could be, I mean, it doesn't have to be for also in the where clause. You can have it in the from clause, right? So if I go back to my SQL, right? So select star from students where name equals Tupac, right? Oh, student, singular, right? So maybe I want to do this, though, in my output, right? Get it lowercase like that, right? Yeah, sorry, yes. Yeah, so her question is, uh, why do people have all these weird idioms in, in, their, in their SQL uh, when at a high level they seem to be all sort of doing the same thing, but it's these one-off things are, are different? I mean, that's sort of related to his question. Why, do, why, are all these, why are all these different nuances for these different systems? Because somebody was writing and thought it was cool, right? <laughs> and then they showed their friends, like, yeah, that's cool, right? So that, the double colon and Postgres, I agree, that's cool, that casting thing, but they only do it, right? Uh, the dual table, I don't know what, I, whatever. Uh, the, yeah, so like, here, let me give another example. So like, there's a shortcut in SQL to, to do basically select star, right? So select star from uh, student gives you all the tuples, right? But in Postgres, which I think is also in the SQL standard, I can just write table and get that, right? In uh, my SQL, I can do that. That's cool. Um, SQLite. Nope, doesn't like it. In DuckDB, they do it, but they also have another one. They can, I think you just go, I think you just go fetch. No, where is it? From, right? You can just do that. So they all have their weird idioms. I mean, so some of these things where are, are based on customer feedback, like the customer says, I want, you know, I need functions that operate on JSON, right? So, so somebody adds that. And a lot of times these features get added before they show up in the standard, right? So like the JSON XML stuff is a good example of this. They, they, that got added to the SQL standard like 2006, but a lot of relational databases at the time, in the early 2000s, had some support for XML. And so what happens is like, the standards body, is, it's, it's not a bunch of randos, it's the people at different companies. So in the SQL standards body, there's, a, there's somebody from Oracle, there's somebody from Sybase, somebody from you know, IBM. And they show up at the, the, the standards committee and they all try to get whatever they have, proprietary thing that they have, they try to get that into the standard, right? Oracle probably did this more, the, the best example more recently, Oracle got their version of property graph queries in the SQL standard. Right? They based theirs on Cypher, which, which is in Neo4j, that's now the, the, the PGQ stuff in the SQL standard. Right, so they got their extensions for, for graph queries in the SQL standard because they were sort of only ones ahead at the time. So that's how these things show up in the SQL standard. And so if everybody has competing ideas for how something should be done, you end up with the lowest common denominator. Something could try to support everyone, but then, then no one exactly supports the, supports the standard. I'm not saying it's a good thing, but like it's, we, we live in a different time also too where there's so many different database companies, and there's not one, there isn't one company I say that owns the market and is and can bend people according to the will, right? So, I said before, in the 1980s, IBM was was the huge company, right? IBM was the the, the computing company. So whatever IBM said, that was considered the, the the de facto standard, and so that's sort of how we ended up with with SQL today. But there isn't a company like that now. Like the closest thing would be. Google put out their standard of SQL called Zeta SQL. Internally, it's called something else. But they, they open source a parser uh, and, 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 the, and the grammar file and, and the spec for their version of SQL. Nobody uses it. And Google's huge, right? The closest you're going to get today is Postgres. A lot of these database companies, when, they, when you start out, instead of building like the, the grammar file from scratch, you go take the Postgres one, hack it up, and, and inject it in your system. That's what we did. Uh, and then DuckDB took our code, and they put it in DuckDB. Right, like this, this bunch of systems are, are based on Postgres grammar because they because it's open source and they use it. That's the closest you're going to get to a universal standard today. But again, I just showed you how there's from in in DuckDB, but that's not in um, in Postgres, right? Because they they've adapted it. Yes. What's the point of having a standard if it's not going to follow? 
this question is, what's the point of having a standard if no one's going to follow it? Uh, I mean, there's a speed limit, but everyone drives over it, right? Like, um, no, so, so I showed you a bunch of select statements, like the, the, and that were slightly different from one system to the next, but you understood what it was doing, basically, right? The nuances of different systems, yeah, you may have to go read the documentation or ask ChatGPT what to do, but like, at a high level, the, the concepts are the same, right? Um, just the, you know, the, 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 the specifics of each, of each system is going to be different. Snowflake is a good outlier. Actually, Snowflake started from scratch in 2013. They didn't take Postgres. They said they just came up with their own grammar. So there, there's now a Snowflake SQL grammar that has things that other systems don't support. Um, if, I was, if I was building a new data system from scratch today, I would not do what Snowflake did. It was a different time. I would start with Postgres and then expand upon it the way DuckDB did. Okay, keep going because it's still a lot to cover. Um, in the sake of time, I'm going to skip output redirection because um, you're not really going to need that for the, the homework. Let's jump ahead to window functions. All right, so before we showed aggregations, uh, they were computing sort of, sort of one-shot calculation across the entire uh, sort of input uh, set to... Or, uh, the, the relation that was being inputted to the, um, to, to the, to, you know, for the aggregate function that you're operating on the from clause. But there's also times where you may need want to support what is called a sliding calculation, where think of it like a, a, a rolling tally. As you go from one tuple to the next, as you're scanning along, you want to update some, some kind of aggregate function so that for every single tuple that you're, you're outputting uh, from your select statement, the aggregate is, is, is sort of a snapshot in time of when that, that tuple was processed. Right? So the way it's, like a, it's like an aggregate function where you're not grouping them to a single output for every single, you know, single final output. For every single tuple, it's going to have its own computation for that aggregation. And so the way this works, you would have like a, a, a function here. Right? This would be all your aggregate functions, min, max, you know, count, uh, average, as we saw before, as well as some additional ones. And then you're going to specify and what is the sort of scope or the range that you're going to compute this calculation for, right? It's basically sort of how to slice up the data and, and, and source it and sort it. So let's look, look at some examples like this, right? So I can have all the aggregation functions that I had before, um, min, max, account, and so forth. But then I have these, these additional ones like the row number that tell me what row my tuple is, 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 is in my output, as well as a rank if I'm, if I'm sorting them. So if I have like an order by clause, like order students by GPA, I can tell you what your position is using the rank function, right? You, couldn't, you, couldn't, you can't do that with a regular aggregation function because there's things just get collapsed down, right? So in this case here, this example here, I can do select star from row number over and then the empty parentheses because um, I'm not partitioning it. And that'll give me output like this, what it'll tell me, again, for all my output tuples, where, where do I appear, that, appear in the list for that? Right. Um, if you have the over clause, you can specify how you want to group uh, group tables together, or sorry, group tuples together when computing the window function, and then you can use the partition by, like a group by, of how to how to group them up. So, right, so for, for this query here, we're doing select the course ID and the student ID from the enrolled table, and I want to get the 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 row number of each of each of each student record or in the enrolled table. Um, but then I want to partition it by course ID. So I would get an output like this. For every single course, uh, it would tell me, the, for every student ID, what, what position they are in, in, that, in that group. Right? It's sort of it's a cluster like this. And then if you have an order by clause, you can then can control how the tuples will be sorted within, within either a partition or with, within the window. Right? So in this case here, now I can order the students by uh, but the enrolled table based on the, on the course ID. So there's a more complicated example here. So we want to find the student with the second highest grade uh, for each course. So for this one here, we're going to have a nested query, which we'll, we'll discuss in a second. But basically, I have a, a select statement that has a from clause. And inside that from clause, I have another query. right? And I can inside this, this inner query, I can reference uh, Actually, this here, I'm doing the lookup on the enrolled table, and then the outer query can just do filtering based on the output 
of, of this nested query. I'm going to cover nested queries in a second. So the first thing we're going to do is going to group the tuples uh, by the course ID uh, and then sort them by the grade. And then we'll get the rank would be the, what, what is their position uh, in the sorted list of, of grades. Right? And then in my where calls here, I can reference now the, the, uh, the, 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 window, the window function calculation uh, for co column. Right? So any questions about this? Yes. Basically, can you make up your window functions using group buys? The question is, can I, can I make a window function using group buys? Yeah, so like you can group buy the, uh, actually. Let's try it, see, see what you're saying. All right, so. Uh, group by the grade first, and then, and then sort the subset. All right, so we'll do this, we'll do this in Postgres. Right, so again, select star from, from the role table, and then we'll get the row number of uh, you know, where each student appears, right? Um, and then the second, <laughs> excuse me, the second example was uh, we're going to get a course ID, student ID, and then the row number. We're going to partition it by the, the course ID. So th and then we're just going to order them the, in the output by, by the course ID, right? So in this, again, in this case here, we see that we have for each course, 1545, 721, and 826, right? Here's the students that are enrolled in them, and then this is their position within, within each group. And then my last example was like this, and this is where you were asking whether you can do a group by. Um, we're now here again, so I can get the, the first, the inner query is gonna give me the, the, the rank position of every record, and the rank is just where you are in, in the sorting output. Um, actually, yeah, let, me, let me remove the, where, the this part here first, right? So here's here's the output of the of the the inner query of the select rank. So for every every course, I'm going to get the uh, the grades and I'm going to order them by the grades. And then the rank is just where their position is in the you know within the sort of list of the grades. And the rank can have repeats. So if I say I insert another record here, so insert into enrolled. Values. So we need a student ID. Let's do have Tupac take. Um, so values course ID would be fifteen seven twenty one, and let's say he got a. Let's give him a name. He's dead. Um, um, order by grade. That's ordered by their order by rank thing. But actually, that, that that screws up the partition. Let me get rid of that. Sorry. All right. So here, what we're doing is uh, for every every single course again, we're getting the grade and then with the sorter and the rank. And so we inserted this record here, Tupac. We gave an A, but there was also another student who got an A in the same class. And therefore, they both have the same rank position of one. And then for the, the student that got the C, their rank position is three. So rank, you can have duplicates. Row numbers will not. So yeah, so you're proposing to do what? A bunch of random group? So group by the, uh, Where? The like, CID? Uh, sorry, in the inner query or what? Sorry. Uh, so, yeah, make, make, so basically, like, try, is it possible to recreate the same query using group by? Uh, the question is, is it possible to recreate the same query using group by? Um, you, wouldn't ha you wouldn't be able to get the rank, right? Because you wouldn't be able to get what, what, what is my sort position. There isn't a concept of that in, 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 in SQL, right? So, so row, row number is interesting because it is, let's do that, row number. Make the point here. Switch to row number. Row number. So row number is interesting because it's calling it's calling it rank, but trust me, it's row number. It's because again, it's bag algebra. There is no sort order in in these relations, and that's a sort of weird concept that we think about programming. Like, what do you mean there's there's not an ordering? Like, because we're used to programming like under x86, where there's a you know uh, the ordering how memory operations occur. Right? There isn't any of that here. Everything can be unordered. So 
in without a window function, you can't get a row number because there's no way to say where do I exist in this position, you know, in my position of my output. Um, Oracle does have row number; they hide it from you. You can get it, but like it's, it's that's just an Oracle thing. Um, so, so the window functions allow you to, in addition to doing the av averages and all the other aggregates, it allows you to, to, to get the order of things in a way that you would not be able to get otherwise. Okay. All right. So I should have showed nested queries before, but let's just go through it in more de more detail. So a nested query, nested queries are a really powerful concept, sometimes called subqueries, where it allows you to have a query inside of a query inside of like inside of a query. Like you can have multiple queries inside of sort of overarching calling queries, and you would need this because you want to be able to express certain computations. Uh, it would be difficult to express certain computations without these nested queries, without taking the data out, doing some computation, and then putting it back in the, in the database system. So it allows us to put these things together to to curate more complex uh, logic than we would not be able to otherwise do. And these inner queries can appear almost anywhere inside of a, a select statement, or actually really almost any query. Like you can have them in the select output, the from clause, the where clause. You can put them in update queries and delete queries. right? It, 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 and they can now reference other tables within your own query. Like it's, it's, a, it's a very powerful construct. So the basic idea is something like this. So here we're doing select the, from the name table. And then I want to get the. Uh, the name of a student that is at least enrolled in, in one course. So you can think of this out this the select statement at the top part, that's called the outer query. And then the, this inner part here, we would call this the inner query. So nested queries are notoriously difficult for database systems to optimize. Um, right? Because you think about it, the stupidest way to execute this query would be for every single tuple in my student table, rerun this thing. Right? Get the list of all the student IDs, then compute the int. The way to really execute this, this is just a join for this one example here, right? This one's easy to do because uh, you know you're looking for this this thing to match something here, so you can do like convert that to a quality predicate. Things get more complicated when there's uh, non-trivial relations between the inner query and the outer query. We won't we'll, we'll, we'll come into that later in the semester, but this is something. Uh, this is again, this is the hardest. one of the hardest part of, of database systems. And the only system that does this, does nested queries correctly, is the system called Umbra, which is a, is a academic system out of Germany. Um, DuckDB does it correctly now for two reasons. One, because they copied what Umbra did. It's in papers. It's, it's not like they stole the ideas. Um, and then we also sent them patches last semester out of 721. So we fixed it for them that they, they can do some of these nested queries correctly, at least, at least for, with lateral joins. Um, so DuckDB is probably the best implementation of this. A lot of times, there's a bunch of heuristics, uh, hacks. Again, we'll, we'll cover this later. My SQL is always the worst. It's gotten much better, though. Um, all right, so, the, so here's a query like this. So we want to get the name of the students enrolled in 15.445. So we have the outer query that we say you know, we want to get the name from the student table. And then we want to have this where clause. We want to specify the logic to, that will get us the student ID of the set of people that are taking 445. So this is a way to sort of think about how you want to actually construct this. Start with the outer query or what the overarching uh, computation or the output you want to be, and then you figure out what the inner part needs to be uh, separately. So in this case here, we can convert this English part here into a, to a nested query like this, but now we need to be able to reference it uh, or do, do the, the check that we want in the where clause of the outer query, and we'd use that, that in clause that we, that we had before. And so in this case here, the now we see that the student ID in the in this where clause here of the outer query, that's referencing the student ID from the, the outer query. But the second student ID in the inner query, that's referencing the student ID in the in, in the in the enroll table. So the the parser in the in the database system is smart enough to recognize the, the context of where a column is being referenced to know which table you're 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 looking at. In the cases where it doesn't know that if it's two things have the same name, it'll throw an error and, and make you qualify. Uh, the table name of where a column is coming from. So there's a bunch of different ways you can, you can interact with nested queries to do you, instead of where clauses. So you can have things like a, an all command or all operator that, that every row in the nested query has to satisfy some kind of constraint. You can have any, or some, it's sometimes called sum is the alias, uh, S-O-M-E, where you can say at least one row must match my, match my subquery. The in clause is this, that I showed before. It's the same thing as is equals any, 
And then exist just means that I want to find something where I know there's there's at least one match. Sorry, there's just one row being returned, but I don't actually care what's in it. So I can rewrite the, the example I had before. Instead of using in, I can use equals any, and it's considered equivalent. And so we, we can show real quickly how uh, Postgres picks different plans for this, and you see how it's actually being executed. Hmm. Right, so here's our query. We have Riz and Tupac taking the class. Um, so in SQL, you can put this explain keyword in front of it, of any, of any query. And what that's going to do, if the system supports it, it'll come back with the query plan and tell you what, what operations would it execute if it actually tried to execute this thing. Right? So when we run that, we get something like this that's going to tell us, basically, you think of this as a tree structure. So these are, these are the leaf nodes, and then it builds up. This is the final output. So what this is telling us, that we're going to do a, the Postgres wants to do a sequential scan on the enroll table, and then it's going to hash it, because it's doing a hash join up there, which we'll, we'll cover what a hash join is later on. And then it does a sequential scan on, on the student table, and then now it does uh, my matching on the student ID, uh, with the enrolled student, student ID with this enrolled student ID. So Postgres was smart enough to convert this nested query into a join, which is always going to be the fastest way to execute something. Uh, when you have these kind of references. We can try the same thing in MySQL. But you get, their explain output is terrible. Uh, there's a way to get, ex I forget the syntax. You gotta put like an extender or something like that. I forget how to do it in MySQL. There's a way to get something a little bit better. Um, in SQLite, I don't think you can do this. Oh, you can do this. What's that? Oh, <laughs> what is this? <laughs> oh, uh. All right, uh, all right, SQLite. So they don't like the select statement, um, which is surprising, right? Why doesn't that work? Let's see if DuckDB does it. They give the output. DuckDB has very pretty. Um, they give you. They give you nice little trees. <laughs> you guys are easily amused. <laughs> this impresses you, like Unicode output for explain. Oh my gosh! All right. Um, but yeah, so it gives you the shows you what the physical plan is, um, and then uh, we can try it in Oracle. Right, has the right output. I've, there, there, we'll do, we need this another time. There's a, getting the plan out of, out of Oracle and SQL Server is, is a huge pain. But I'm actually surprised that um, SQLite doesn't support this. Select. I'm not going to debug this live. Um, yeah, I don't know why it doesn't like that. Let's try it in. Ah, there we go. Didn't like equals any, you liked in. All right, so in SQLite, if I run explain, I get this. So the way SQLite does, which is genius, is that uh, it, the way it executes your query plan, it converts the query plan into its own DSL, its own opcodes, and it has its own VM that runs the opcodes. Think of like the JVM. You take Java code, convert it into Java bytecode, and then the JVM executes it or interprets it. That's what SQLite does, right? Uh, we'll, we'll discuss query compilation later, later in the semester. Um, so you got to put, I think, explain plan. Uh, plan there's extended. There's some syntax to get the real plan, but whatever. Trust me, it's there. All right, so, uh, so yeah, so they all do something slightly different. Um, and then if the system's smart, it can try to convert it into uh, a join. All right, so we'll skip this and sake of time because we got, we got to get through. Um, I want to get through lateral joins and, um, and, and CTEs. All right, so lateral joins are a, uh, it's a newer concept, but, and not all systems are going to support it. But the basic idea is that it's going to allow you to have a, 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 a nested query 
reference data in, a, in another query that is adjacent to it. So normally, in, if you have two nested queries, one nested query can't reference what's inside the other nested query right? because it doesn't know about what's inside of it. But with a lateral join, uh, it allows you to do this. And you can almost think of like it's like a, like a for loop where one table for every single, every single, uh, every single tuple in the outer, in this outer for loop, you can, do some, you can run some query, do some computation here. So in this simple example here, I have two, uh, I have two nested queries. I have a select one as, as x. So this is turning back a single tuple that has one column with the value 1. And then my lateral join here can now reference the, the output of this first query here and just do plus 1 on it. Right? So I get, I, get, I get 1 and 2 that way. Right? Without lateral, you can't do this. Because right? this would be treated as completely two separate queries, which we can do this in Postgres and, and see real quickly. Right? Um, so select star from an in inner query, select one as. Oh, sorry. Yep, yep, yep. As x as t1. Right? So I can get back a single tuple that has, that has one in it, right? But if I try to put a nest, another nested query next to it, select, uh, say, 2 as y as t2, right? I'll, I'm getting the Cartesian product, but I can't reference inside of this thing. I can't go t1.x plus 1, right? Because it doesn't know about t1 because those two sep sort of, those queries are running, running separately. If I add the lateral keyword, now my, my second nested query or, or can, can reference whatever's in the first one, right? And you can chain these things together uh, as, as many times as you want. Actually, let's go back to it quickly. Let's see what the query plan for this one would be. In theory, you should convert this to a join. Well, all right. That, it, it did a shortcut. We can ignore that. OK. Because it basically says, I, I know what the answer is. I don't have to run anything. and just spits out the answer. That's what it did. <laughs> like select 1 plus 1, it knows, what, it knows how to compute that without running a query. All right. Let's look at a more complicated example. So say I want to calculate the number of students that enrolled in each course. And then uh, I want to count the number of students enrolled in each course. And then I also want to get all the, the average GPA of all the students in that course. Um, and so you, yes, you can write this without using a lateral join. I just want to show you how to do this with a lateral join. So there's two, going to be two nested queries, where we have this select statement on the, out, at the outer part. And then for every single tuple that's in the course table, I want to then compute the number of enrolled students. And then again, for every single student in the course table, I want to compute the, the average GPA of all the enrolled students. Right? So I could write it as this. We have two, again, two nested queries that are, that are with the lateral keyword, where, again, the first one here, I compute the, uh, the, at, the count. And again, inside of it, I'm able to reference what's in, in the, the outer query here, or the, the adjacent query. And then for this one down here, same thing. I can have this one referenced there. Now, I'm not showing this example here because it's a bit contrived, but like, in the second lateral qu query, I can also reference what was in the first one. These things get changed to get chained together. And again, this is a different concept when you think of SQL, because SQL is supposed to be unordered. We're not specifying the order. We don't specify the order in which the database system should, should execute anything. We're not really doing that. We're just telling it the order we, we want the computation to, to be performed to compute the answer that we want. So the database system can decide, do I want to rewrite this as a bunch of joins and just execute them all concurrently, um, or it can decide to do it one after another, um, which we can then again, test Postgres real quickly and see what it does. Which I don't think I've copied here. Uh, yeah, I sorry. I don't, I don't have copy pasted real quickly, so we'll, you, can, you can try it online later. All right. All right, the last thing I want to show you is common table expressions. And so CTEs were added 10-ish, 20-ish years, years ago. Um, and this is a... Sort of similar to nested queries, or similar to uh, if you're writing data to like a temp table or something like that. It's a way for us to take specify a query that we want to get materialized. Maybe I don't want to use that word. We want to specify a query that could be stored in quotation marks at some virtual table, and then we can have another query reference whatever's inside of it. Right. So in my really simple example here, I have a this with clause 
I give my CTE a name, then I have my as statement, and then in whatever's inside this parentheses, whatever select query here is going to get bound to this, 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 this name here. And then anything that, that comes below after the, the with statement can then reference it as if it was a table. Right? So again, so, so, so sim simple example like this. So I essentially the as clause is binding things to uh, names to whatever whatever's inside my, my with statement here. So I have a, again a no table query select one and two that's gonna produce one tuple. It has a value of one column with one, one column with two. But then within my uh, with my with statement up here, I can give now names to the columns, which then can be referenced down below in, in, in the query. You can do weird things too, like you can actually in Postgres will let you actually name the columns the same thing. Um, but then when you actually try to reference it below, it'll throw an error. Uh, so you know, again, this is an example where like the syntax is, is roughly the same, but the semantics can be different across across different systems. So let's see how so let's see an example how we actually want to use it. So for this one, we want to again, we want to find the student record that has the highest ID that's enrolled in at least in one course. Again, we showed how examples how to do this with, with nested queries, and we do the joins. Um, but now we can do it with the CTE, where inside the CTE, first thing I'm going to do is compute the, the max student ID from, from the enroll table. And then now in my select statement down below, I can just reference my CTE to get that max ID and then do my, my join on that. Again, the database system should be smart enough to realize that Oh, I only have to run this uh, the CTE once, materialize it, and then now I can reference it as if it was a like a temp table in in, in any query below that that calls it. So, any question about CTEs? Okay, just to finish up. All right, so again, hopefully the main takeaway from all this is that SQL is not a dead language. There's a lot of cool things you can do with it. Uh, you want to try to do as much computation as you can within a single uh, statement. Now, it's going to be nested queries. You can do a bunch of other weird stuff inside of it. Uh, we want to avoid the round trips going back and forth between the client and, and the server. Because again, the database system should, in theory, be smart enough to know what's the best way to execute the query that you're giving to, giving to it. As soon as you take stuff out of the database, do some Python code on it. That's obviously outside the, the purview of the database system. So we can't optimize, it can't optimize that, that Python code. If you keep everything inside a database system, it should be able to uh, make a good effort how to, how to optimize it further. And again, also the main takeaway from all of this is that there is a SQL standard. Nobody follows it exactly. Every single database system is going to be slightly different. People claim that, oh, it's great to be, if you support SQL because then you can go and be portable. Like if I, if I write my application on, on my SQL, I can very easily just port it to Postgres. That is not the case, right? Oftentimes, whatever data system you pick at the beginning, that's what you're going to be stuck with for a long time. Because it's, 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 it's not non-trivial to move over. All right, so last thing. Homework one, it'll be out today. It's going to be writing SQL queries to do basic data analysis. This year, we're going to require you to do it on SQLite and DuckDB. All right? <laughs> the reason why is because you will write, write the same query. Syntax will be slightly different. It won't be too bad. But you'll run the same query in SQLite, and then you'll run it in DuckDB, and you'll see which one's faster. OK? And then you'll, you'll have this epiphany, oh, one of them is much faster than the other one. Anybody take a guess which one's going to be faster? Why? What's that? He says more efficient SQL queries. Part of the reason, maybe. It's not based on Postgres. Because DuckDB does not interpret. DuckDB does not interpret. That's not the answer either. OK. So yes, in the back, one, one last shot. That's not the reason. OK, so you'll run these queries. DuckDB should be faster. You'll be like, OK, why? That's the rest of the semester, OK? <laughs> All right, so next, this will be it for SQL. Next class, we'll actually start talking how do you build a system, OK? Yay. Hit it. <laughs> yeah, this shit is gangsta. <laughs> gangsta. <laughs> Bad boys are gangsta. I'm the poppy with the motherfucking hookup 28 a gram, depending on if it's cook up You ain't hit a mob yet? Still got you shook up I 
smack you with the bottom of the clip and tell you, look up, show me where the safe's at before I blow your face back. I got a block on taps, the feds can't trace that. Style is like tamper proof, you can't lace that. The Dominican, or you could call me Dominican. Black skelly, black leather, black suede Timberlands. My all black 38 is send you to the pearly gates. You get consignment trying to skate, and that's your first mistake. I ain't lying for that cake, your fam, I see you wake. My grams is heavyweight, then ran through every state. When they ask me how I'm living, I tell them I'm living great. Thank you.